What is up, down, and sideways? All oh, you lovely individuals. It is another Reppy of League Unlock. Eric and Mark here with you. A beauty is where a couple days after semifinal action here, but we gotta we gotta get our not hot takes, just our thoughts on what went through for an absolutely delivering of a banger weekend of semi-final action. Obviously, T1 JDG, one of the most the most hyped up matchup we've had at World so far, and safe to say it delivered on the hype mark. Very safe to say delivering on the hype from this series. Game three in this series alone delivered on the hype, the excitement that everybody had to see these two Titanic squads clash together. And it wasn't silver scrapes, but it still was one hell of a series between T1 uh, and JDG. And then even on the flip side, you're looking over at BLG versus Weibo Gaming. They do give us the silver scrapes, five full games. What a weekend of action. And the level of play, especially that T1 JDG matchup was absolutely maybe the highest we've gotten at Worlds. That game three, as you mentioned, felt like a game five with the way that the momentum shifted, how close back and forth it was. T1's down 4K and looked like they're about to lose the game. And then, blessed be the Demon King Faker. Absolutely insane. I love just seeing all these all these people's reactions to that play. Everyone, if you could just put a montage of everybody screaming Faker, I think we could reach, you know, like earthquake level decibels of a Taylor Swift concert. It's insane. And yeah, I think that we could rival that going on at that type of level from Faker, the big play. Everybody wanting to cheer for their number one player of all time. Your man, he shows up and he dishes out these clutch plays. He gets revenge for 2017. All these years later, the Rulers Varus catching out Faker's karma. Uh-uh, other way around. It is Faker's Azir catching out Varus. The Rulers Varus right there in that mid lane. And this is one of those things that you got to look at that game three and we can talk about as well. The moment for T1, the fight they went around the dragon pit where owner is flashing over the arrow from on. This is one of those things you got to be looking at and you got to be saying that there's there's only one option that you can make that is that positive outcome. There's plenty that you can make that aren't going to work out, that are going to be negative. You are going down. That's the one. And they managed to pull it off, make that call in a split decision. They get it. You listen to the comms around the big uh, Azir play later on from Faker in this game three. The clear communication from the squad. Look at me. I'm going in. I'm trying to make a play. All these things. T1 gets it done. And you know what? It's not just about Faker in these big plays. You got to be looking at the rest of the members of T1 contributing. And the big one for me, look at that stopwatch on Guma keeping himself alive on that big pick on the Callista. That Callista goes down, doesn't get that bailout return. There's no way T1 is ending the game at that point. A couple more members of JDG are up and it's not a sealed deal just yet. That game three, how close it was, how pivotal that turnaround was from T1. You felt that whoever went up 2-1 at that point, it was gonna be unstoppable having that momentum in the series. And it absolutely ended up being the case in that fourth game. Guma on the Varus, absolutely feeling himself in the teaser. He's talking about, I'm not gonna stop Ruler, I'm gonna crush him. And he crushed that Zeri in that fourth game. Uh, that one team fight where he 1v2s is some of the cleanest Varus kiting you will ever see in this game. And now listen, Looking at T1, you go back to that BLG series that qualified them for top eight. They are eight and one against the top three teams in the LPL. You look at this glow up, the level that they've had since then, and you can highlight all five members, but who, who's had the best glow up and the biggest, you know, jump in power? Because this team is light years different from what we saw even in the LCK finals against Gen.G. I think a lot of people need a little fresh reminder that when they were, you know, one and seven without Faker, Faker steps back in, everything starts to turn around. The only team that this organization has lost to is Gen G, losing in those LCK finals, losing here at Worlds. That's it. Everybody else getting taken down by Faker and T1. Of course, starting with Faker himself in the mid lane, I think, of course, that fresh reminder that he is at very most at the tippity top of this League of Legends mountain. So many times we see young players coming up and we're very excited about them and their talent, their potential and everything else. And we forget 
about that eternal class that Faker offers and what he brings to the team in those clutch moments. You're seeing it big time at this performance, but there's no doubt in my mind, and we can talk about some of the other members of T1 because everybody's leveled up, but it has to be owner in the jungle because even when T1 was successful early in the year with Faker in the lineup, you didn't see this type of owner. The way that he is playing on champions like Rel, like Jarvan right now, this is peak performance, peak playmaking from uh, this spot for T1. And I think owner probably is the right answer because he had the most to level up. But again, you look at the rest of this team, Zeus is gonna be drawing Aatrox bands or first picks across the board. He's confident to be picking Yone in the top side. Guma and Kyria, it's not close. They've been the best bot lane at this tournament. They just finished dismantling Ruler and Missing. Oh my goodness, yes they did. And it, it's so good to be talking about both those angles, looking at one by one. Zayu's feeling comfortable, feeling confident enough to bust out that Yone, once again, the signature champion that we have seen him be able to disrupt the top lane with in that carry position. And then, you, as you mentioned, Guma and Kyria, where Guma arguably was the best performing member with, uh, with Faker out of the lineup, has continued to increase that performance, has doubled down and has exercised with the finals on the head. And if they can get that one, we'll finally get rid of the demons of the underperformance last year at the international events. Kyria, this is more so just a return, a refresher, a reminder that this is the quality, the level of player that he is. I think we saw a little bit of struggles, of course, with Baker out of the lineup as well. One of those players affected by a considerable amount. We have seen that bounce back and we have seen that creativity, that confidence, that energy that he brings to this T1 lineup make a difference and i think what you're seeing now with this uh current form of t1 is truly what separates the best teams from the great teams on these international events and that is they're shaping their own meta it's it's not just the bot lane that they're playing whatever owners doing what zeus is doing you're making teams kind of say well a couple of these target picks are too good out of t1 we're forced to ban them away and you're you're really just shaping the entire landscape of what the power picks are at this event. We've seen T1 do this in years past. They're not being slaves to the matter. They're creating their own path. That confidence in, in their re excuse me, on the meta and how they want to dictate draft pick ban, draft and everything else and how to utilize these champions the way that they want to be, the way that they optimize and excel at. That has been a big thing, seeing this T1 roster thrive, the players, the the coaching staff, and how they've been able to do that, I think absolutely deserves praise, deserves that recognition. Because this draft, these you know little things that come through, of course, game one, you had the Jin Bard in that bottom lane dominating. You're thinking about that. All these other things. T1 really is showing that they have that confidence. They have that belief in themselves and their ability to play out what they think the meta is. Unfortunately, we got to look on the other side of this coin the golden road is golden no more the bricks were exploded blown up by the t1 boys but jdg lpl spring champs summer champs msi champs semi-finals at worlds but because it's such a star-studded and 16 million dollar roster are we really calling this year a failure for jdg that seems insane it seems insane, but when you do mention, of course, the salary bringing in this roster, the accomplishments that this roster was able to put out and show what is capable, there is that realm where you can think about it as a disappointment. I think overall, for me, the level of dominance that you showed and, and you know the consistency of that has to weigh in, has to be a positive for this JDG team. And then there is that, you know, kind of tough love angle where you have to look at it and say, yes, that was difficult. And yes, that was what is expected of you. But you still didn't deliver. You still didn't step up and cross that finish line. You set out at the big race, the big marathon. You have to be looking at it that type of way. And I think when you had players performing at the type of level that Ruler was heading into this event, Kanavi, I think there is an angle to look at this JDG team and be disappointed. I think, of course, there's a lot of human emotion stuff with that as well. And I love that, you know, side mention after the series is over, the riot camera guy goes up to Faker. They want him to do the thumbs down. We took down JDG. You guys suck. Faker shakes his head and he gives him the thumbs up. He understands that this was a titanic clash of great squads and you got to pay respect to a year that is ended. Yeah, and that's why. 
everyone loves Faker is because he doesn't, you know, go into that uh, gladiator esque ah, absolutely destroyed. He's Faker. He's the nice guy until you're on the rift, and then he will absolutely <laughs> destroy you. But I mean, it's it's hard to you know be disappointed in any members of JDG because they've had such an incredible year. But I mean, you can look at underperformance in this series, whether that's you know. I mean, how long have they had to listen to the talk of the Golden Road? As soon as they won the summer split, that's all we were talking about heading into Worlds. Even after MSI, I feel like people were talking about this. So I imagine the pressure was immense for them in this matchup where they were still favorites, even though T1 was absolutely ramping up. But I mean, heading into this event, we've already highlighted owner. Kanavi, I think for most people, was First, second best jungler coming into it. And I, I tell you, Owner in his current form from summer was nowhere near any top 20 list. So that's maybe the one matchup, especially that Belveth game. That was rough out of Kanavi. Yeah, and I think that's one of those ones where you can really attribute to just mental boom. This is one of those ones where you're going to have to look back at how you responded, you know, internally and all those thoughts and emotions that went through you and what led to kind of this almost you know uh, debilitating performance in that game for the way that he looked on this bell that totally lost out of sync with the rest of the crew getting blown up all these things was not what you would expect from number one kanavi and number two Kanavi on Belveth, a, a champion that we have seen him be very comfortable on, even in clutch moments. So I think that is something to be paid into. As you mentioned, that pressure, the golden road, all that talk, it builds, you know, accomplishment after accomplishment, success after success for this JDG team. That pressure, that view, that everything, the dream of it, it all builds up. And I think, as you mentioned, you get that game three, though, how tense it was. And with it not going the way of JDG and being put against the wall, I think it was a tipping point. And unfortunately for Kanavi, he fell off. And I mean, the other angle, the other matchup you can look at. I know Ruler maybe wasn't at that insane um, level, best player in the world that we've been talking about all year long. But again, the performance out of these T1 members were absolutely insane. Like we're highlighting Faker constantly and it's more to do with his legacy and leveling up in the biggest moments. But night teaser video talking about ending the Korean mid lane dynasty. It felt like time and time again, even in the game that JDG won, when team fights were coming around, Faker was having the bigger impact over and over again. And he's the guy, he was the one that you trusted to make these big plays. He's the one that you would be looking at the setup for the fights and you're trying to search for him and follow him and look at what play he was going to make. You didn't ever really feel like that with Knight, even in that game too, when he had some power, you didn't really feel too much of that on this side. So I think an underperformance from him, you can look at the top side. You can talk about 369, someone that has had an answer for so many other top laners, uh, you know, almost every other one from the LCK. It seems that Zeus is the one thing that he cannot stop in that top side. Doesn't matter what Zeus is picking. If it's the Aatrox, if it's the Yone that we love to talk about, my man was having his time in the top side. And the reality is, if you want to talk about this as a failure for JDG, if they're on the other side of the bracket, 100% we're talking about the finals matchup of T1 versus JDG. Yeah, the, there's no question about it. But these are the two top teams that we have seen throughout this event right now. And I think it's going to be one of these ones where depending on how the finals goes and if it goes as expected, I think it's still going to stay that this T1 JDG matchup was the pinnacle of the tournament. And I know that's, you say, ah, well, they ran into T1, but if you're the best team in the world going for the Golden Road, you're not running into anyone that's going to stop you. You are the team that people are worried about. So had to get it done against T1. They didn't do it. It still just feels like having a sweep of all the major tournaments and winning worlds as your baseline for a team, even as stacked as this JDD, JDG squad is, that just seems a little absurd to have those expectations. I'm not ready to call this entire year a failure for JDG. Yeah, I think there is a lot of progress that is still being made, and I think it is still one of those ones where, you know, you I there is an avenue if you want to take the hardest road possible and say that, yes, this is the line, this is my line in the sand, you got to accomplish it or you suck. Okay, sure, maybe that will be it, but I think that you're going to be a, a very grumpy and disappointed League of Legends fan if that's got to be your line in the sand. 
you got to look at the success, a lot of positives throughout the year, a lot of things gained for this JDG squad. And I think you look at yourselves and you got to say, okay, do we take another run at this one? I, I think I think the reason that people are having that sentiment of it being a failure is because it's pretty much guaranteed this was going to be a one-year run for this team, regardless of how things played out solely because you can't afford these guys again. They're going to get some opportunities elsewhere. These are world-class players top to bottom. And I mean, maybe they'll shock the world and re-sign everybody, but even JDG, I don't think can be affording that. It's hard to see a world where they would be able to find a repeat, another type of run. I think maybe the only angle you could talk about is to do with the salary caps coming through for the LCK and, and whatnot. Maybe that has an effect on how many players want to come back and sign contracts, what's going on. Sure, that's a different discussion. But this JDG team, I think, was something special to see throughout the year, the way that they played, the combination that they were able to do. And it is just one of those ones where unfortunately not able to complete this golden road like so many other fantastic teams before them. Now, the other side of the semifinals was the one that gave us the Game 5 LPL rivalry. Bin versus the Shy. We said, these are the guys who are going to break up the top lane meta. And what did we get? We got the Rumble, who's, you know, been a forefront in the metal. Maybe not to the level that the Shy was dumpster and bin on that one but then we get a grave sighting a quinn sighting that didn't have much of an effect but that top lane alone lived up to the hype in this series the quinn i'm certainly less sold on i think i can see that angle where she can fit in and be that disruptive be that big you know surprise pick that changes something out and you don't have that counter okay i can believe that in a, in a sense and i can trust the shy try and bust it out I ain't trusting the results that we saw in that one right now to roll through with that pick. But I am trusting the Graves because that certainly did excel and show us the type of power, the, the creativity around that pick and where it does counter in type of thing. That is going to be one of those ones that I, I, I'm going to have my eye on heading into these finals for sure. Yeah, and obviously Aatrox is going to be the most contested top lane pick probably alongside the Rumble uh, in this matchup now against T1. But Mark, we are, we are living in a timeline where Weibo Gaming are in the World Finals. Another fourth seed following up from what DRX did last year, getting there. And I know the road has been, you know, less difficult for Weibo based on their matchups, but beating BLG in the fashion that they did in a pretty convincing game five, they've earned this spot in finals with that series win. It's nothing new. We've seen it even with the group stage type of draw situation where, you know, it just happens. You get a little bit lucky here or there, and then you, oh, we drew these guys in quarters, all these. You find yourself in those finals. This is pretty great. Another year as a fourth seed, making it through all the way to the big dance, kind of crazy. Uh, this is one of those ones where you examine Weibo Gaming. I don't think anybody ever realistically had Weibo in this type of position, even when they did qualify. For worlds did you ever really think that this was going to be a possibility for them very lucky throughout the swiss stage very lucky at this point in, in the draft to be on the side that they were have the opponents that they did but you still got to take care of business and weibo gaming have certainly done that and they certainly have shown us that if you get into a best of five series you underestimate them you take it lightly at any type of chance they're going to take that angle and they're going to pressure it and make sure that you're paying for it at least with one game and you know this team, these players are going to lean in the chaos. Happens in an LPL, all LPL matchup in semis. They're going to have to lean a little bit harder into that chaos. Matching up against T1. And obviously we'll do a full preview. They're going to be huge underdogs against T1 now. But don't sleep on these guys. They got two world champions. The Shy last did it in Korea. A hometown crowd for him. Maybe they won't be rooting for him as much as T1. But... And Zhao, who got some experience taking down Faker and T1 in international events, obviously hasn't done it at Worlds, but I feel like the underrated storyline here going into this is Zhao, who's first World Finals. I, it's crazy because it gets so lost and all the excitement, T1, you know, JDG series and T1 in the finals, and oh my God, we have Weibo there and all the shy, it's his birthday, all these things pop up and through. And yes, Zhao, who getting a little bit, uh, you know, done dirty and forgotten by people in this type of situation. This is one of those ones where, you know, you can talk about a lot of different rematches or little things that you're examining in these two squads facing head to head. 
I'm thinking back to this, you know, 2017 semifinals between Faker and Xiaohu. Faker, five games of Galio. Don't think we're seeing five games of Galio in this finals, but you got to be thinking about that one if you're Xiaohu. You want that revenge because out of all the years that Xiaohu could have got it done, I think that one in 2017 was a pretty prime option for him with RNG. Faker denying it like he has done to so many before. And that's the thing with him being around so long. He's got storylines against all these other remaining players. How much were they hyping up the ruler one? And now, uh, obviously, Zhao Hu, who they've played at MSI, at Worlds a couple of times, in best of fives, almost always. And uh, if I'm T1, I'm at least hovering the Galio pick and pick ban, right? Just to, just to get in Zhao Hu's head a little bit. I don't think we're going to see Faker hovering it. I think someone like Zeus or Guma would love to hover that Galio for those little bit of memories. Uh, and now, back on Weibo real quick, because again, no one was really predicting them to be here, even though they've had this easier road to get here. Much like T1, although not to the same level, they have leveled up throughout this event from what you were seeing in their first matchups uh, against KT Rolster and even you know early BLG since then they've leveled up big time. Yeah, I think even you, you could talk about lots of the players here. You could look at Crisp in the bottom lane as someone uh, in that support position that has stepped up, has been able to have a better impact for the squad overall. Light, of course, stepping up in these key moments for Weibo, specifically talking about game five, major step up there for this Weibo squad, holding it down. Even Weiwei doing great jobs in the jungle and holding it down for this squad, for the team. You have to be giving your props over to Weibo and what they did. It still was the favorable side of the bracket, of course. NRG, we can look at that one a little bit, you know, of the LCS. And then you step into that matchup, and there is no kidding around against a BLG. And they're more than up to the task. And they take it all the way through. They clash with them into game five and set themselves up for the finals. And yet, yeah, Light has been one of the most consistent AD carries, but... Guma is angry. Guma has his mojo. Guma is going to be a different beast to be matching up against, as will the rest of T1. But obviously, we will do a full World Finals preview before it gets going over the weekend. But that is it today for League Unlock. Eric and Mark here with you beautiful people. As always, thank you so much for watching, and we will catch you on that flippity flip.